Happy Easter and welcome to The Well's online experience. My name is Chris and I'm one of the pastors here at The Well and I am so excited that you're joining us as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. You know, today is such a special day because the resurrection changed everything. We're gonna learn more about that in a second. But today at The Well, we're having our in-person Easter celebration at Girls Inc. as well as our live stream experience right now. In our online campus, our live stream is so important to us, that's why we're launching our new live stream page today, right on Easter. You're still gonna be able to watch our services on demand on our Facebook page and YouTube channel, but our live experience will have its own special page. It's gonna allow you to chat, easily submit your digital connection card, give and watch past messages all in one place. Plus, we have a brand new app that you can download. All you need to do is uh, create a quick account with your phone number and then you can download the app. We're gonna put the link in our chat section right now. That's it. And be sure to let us know how you like it. Now, last Saturday, uh, we had our Easter basket giveaway and we were able to bless 175 families with a free Easter basket stuffed with goodies. It was so much fun and we were so grateful for this opportunity. Because you know, as a church, we are committed to being a resource and a blessing to those in our city and our community. Now, on Easter, I remember as a kid digging into that Easter basket, but also for that special meal we would have as a family. Now, we would have baked ham with all the fixings for Easter, but what did your family have? Let us know in the comment section what was your Easter dish. And while you're doing that, I want you to know if you're new here today, we have a special welcome to you. We want you to know who we are and what we're all about. Now, The Well is a church in Nashua, New Hampshire that cares deeply about our city and about helping our friends and neighbors know and follow Jesus. I mean, it's really just that simple. Now here at The Well, the messages are for everyone, no matter whether you are in your journey of faith. Uh, if you're a committed follower of Jesus or just curious about who he is, you're welcome here with us. We only have one condition, no perfect people allowed. Now, since we're online today, we encourage you to engage with us this morning. Uh, chat and use the message notes to follow along. We have both PDF notes and a version Bible notes so that you can uh, follow Scott's, Pastor Scott's message today. And don't forget to fill out the digital connection card. We call it the DCC. Just click on that button and you can fill it out right here without leaving the page. And this is the best way here at The Well to stay connected, to take spiritual next steps, to receive prayer, to get more information about what's coming up. Well, today we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus and kicking off a brand new teaching series called Unquarantined. And Pastor Scott is gonna get us started in just a moment from first, let's pray together. Father, we're just so thankful uh, for you and for your son, Jesus. And today we celebrate um, your power over death. Uh, you brought Jesus back from the dead. And because of that, uh, we can have eternal life with you. And God, you know, it all feels like today and uh, this past year that we've just kind of been dead, stuck in this pandemic, and this quarantine, and we're just looking for some freedom, Lord. We're just looking for some hope. And uh, today, uh, the resurrection gives us that hope. So help us to understand how uh, the resurrection applies to our life right now in all different kinds of areas of our life uh, so that we can actually be transformed by you and be transformed by Jesus. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's hear from Pastor Scott. I feel trapped, stuck. When will I feel safe again? When will I stop feeling lonely? Is this marriage going to last? Will we ever get pregnant? When will I get out of debt? When will the waiting end? Will I ever get another job? How long will God stay silent? When, when will things, things open, up? open up? When will things finally open up? Hey, happy Easter, everybody. We're so glad that you've tuned in with us today. My name is Scott. I'm the lead pastor here at The Well. And I mean, what a special day. I was going to say, hey, post... Uh, you know, what your Easter celebration is looking like today, whether it's egg hunt or dressing up, but probably most of you are in your PJs and just rolled out of bed, okay? So anyway, I hope you're having a really great Easter. Um, we're going to kick off a series today that we're calling Un- quarantine uh, because we believe that the Easter event 2,000 years ago historically was the most unquarantined event in all of human history. Uh, it, the, the series is really all about how do we reopen our spiritual life 
to the experience of God and to the power of God at work in your life. And look, all of us have felt uh, how trapping it can feel in a season of quarantine, right? I mean, we've felt that physically, mentally, relationally, uh, uh, economically. I mean, you name it, we've felt the effects of the quarantine effect this past year, okay? So many people have identified uh, what we're experiencing in America as a mental health crisis over the past year. The uh, U.S. Census Bureau back in December said that 42% of Americans that were surveyed displayed symptoms of anxiety or depression. And the Pew Research said that 28% say the pandemic has actually significantly changed their life. There's some pretty dramatic mental health effects. And uh, what is ironic about this is that the younger you are, the more you tend to feel those effects, even though studies are also showing the younger you are, the, the less likely you are to, to get hit hard by coronavirus. But um, half of 18 to 35 year olds uh, have displayed anxiety and over a third of them are feeling more isolated than ever before. So, I mean, the younger you are, the more it tends to hit. And look, uh, as a young parent, I get it, right? Especially in the middle of winter. How many young parents like almost lost their minds in the middle of cold winter? I mean, there are moments where me and my daughters would be like looking out the window and be like, I want to go outside, but it's too cold. And we'd be like, well, I guess we can go to Target, but then we got to put masks on everybody, right? And like, we don't want to do that. And so there were moments where my oldest would be like looking out the window with like sadness in her face and be like, daddy, when's it going to end? And I'd put an arm around her and be like, we're going to get through this, honey. And then five minutes later, I'd be looking out the window and be like, when's this going to end? And she's like, we'll get through this, daddy. Okay. Like, look, we've all, fe uh, fe we've all felt the quarantine effect. It has some pretty nasty things. Okay. So but what it's done is it's, it's left us, a lot of us, wrestling with fear, right? Not just anxiety and depression, but fear. Fear over our health, fear over our finances, our relationships. Uh, and, you know, if we're not careful in this, it can really lead us to a place of deep isolation and loneliness. But, man, loneliness is deadly. Maybe even more than the, the pandemic itself, loneliness has some pretty awful effects when we allow that quarantine effect to put us in that place. Studies show that loneliness is just as damaging, as threatening to our health uh, and our life as, uh, oh, uh, as smoking is, and it's even more deadly than obesity, okay? And that the amazing thing is that loneliness and isolation actually plays on itself. The more lonely and isolated you are, the, the more you tend to be, because your brain, studies show, actually starts to get rewired, where you start seeing other things that are unfamiliar and people that are unfamiliar as threatening. Look, quarantine effect is nasty, but here's why we're talking about it. We believe that the God of the universe wants to break that effect in your life. He doesn't want you to stay afraid. He doesn't want you to be lonely and isolated. He actually wants to free us in so many ways that's going to have a big impact on your marriage, on how you handle your money, on your relationships, your anxiety and depression. He wants to break all of that, but it's going to start with breaking it at the deepest level to break out of quarantine at a soul level, to know the God of the universe, to develop a relationship with him and to journey with him with brand new purpose and joy. So that's what Easter is all about. We're gonna to begin today uh, by talking about how to be open to God as he does that kind of work in our life to break out of quarantine, right? At a soul level. So here's our Easter story. We're gonna be in Matthew 28 today and we're gonna follow the stories of a couple different people and how they respond to the supernatural, to the work and presence of God, and they're all over the map, okay? Uh, so we're gonna begin in Matthew 28 with a group of people who just had their world flipped upside down. They had their expectations on this guy, Jesus, that they thought was going to be their Messiah, and it didn't turn out the way that they expected it to. So we're gonna begin in Matthew 28. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. I love how honest the Bible is. It's like, and the other Mary. Mary was like the most popular name of the day. It was like your Jennifer or Sarah, okay? But like, they're just like the other Mary. She came. Anyway, these ladies, they went to the tomb where Jesus had just been buried. He was dead. Now, that was devastating to them because these ladies experienced freedom and an identity and a purpose to their life after knowing Jesus that was, I mean, it, it had changed them completely. And they, along with all the first century Jews, were expecting this promised one, this Messiah to come and liberate them from all the oppression of Rome uh, and get their land back and have everything just kind of go back to where it was when Israel was in its heyday. And then all of a sudden, they crucified him. 
Jesus was dead, and, and along with that, all their hopes, their expectations about life, I mean, it was just buried in that tomb. And so when they went to the tomb that day, it was like they were, they were going to pick up all the pieces of their life that just got shattered. Maybe some of you felt that this year. Maybe this pandemic has left you feeling like your world just got rocked, okay? Maybe you felt that in a way where like maybe your marriage, like it went through a hurricane and you're not sure that it's gonna survive. Maybe your finances were there or maybe your job situation, your relationships. I mean, some of us, we've had our world shaken this past year and it's left us picking up some of the pieces. Well, here's where the story continues. In verse two, it says, then... Suddenly, right? There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, heaven breaking into the world, right? And going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. If that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. But it says his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow and the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. We'll come back to that in just, just a second. But the angel then said to the women, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen. This is Easter, everybody. This is why we celebrate. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. So uh, they then went quickly and, or they, they said, then go quickly and tell the disciples, he's risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you're going to see him. Now I've told you. <laughs> now, like if you're the women at this point, you're like, well, what? You know, it's mind blown, but it continues. Ready? Uh, uh, so the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid and yet filled with joy. And they ran to tell the disciples. Now, suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. <laughs> like, that'd be like, what? Uh, and they came to him, clasped his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them again, the same words the angels did, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers, go to Galilee and there they're going to see me. God shows up in the middle of the unexpected and the world flipped upside down. God met them and he met them in a dramatic way. It wasn't just like God was like, hey, what's up, everybody? No, it was a violent earthquake, lightning like light that just kind of like overwhelmed them. And I think that's how God often shows up. Like when he shows up, he wants to rearrange everything in your life. God isn't just someone that's like, hey, I love you. You can go ahead and live however you want to live. No, no, God shows up and he violently shakes your life to the point where he's like, I want to rearrange everything in your life. And you've got to be able to come to me in a pretty dramatic confrontation here. And it, here, here's the amazing thing. If God's going to change your life, it's going to happen dramatically where you've got to go all in with him. Now, you know, some of you, you're looking at this and be like, I, I just have a really hard time believing this. You know, I'm, I'm a little bit more on the skeptical side. How in the world can someone rise from the dead and the empty grave and everything? You know, so here's, here's something to, to think about, okay? If you're skeptical, you know, I just want you to know, number one, all of Christian faith hinges on this. All of it. If Jesus didn't rise from the grave, then what you're doing and watching this right now, completely pointless. The Apostle Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 15. It's our faith is worthless. It's useless. So everything hinges on this. But what's so interesting about this is that historians looking back in the first century, nobody's disputing the empty tomb. Nobody disputes the empty tomb. In fact, uh, there's no other way to explain the explosive growth of these early Christians. The question is, how did the tomb get empty, okay? For, for some, they said, well, you know, maybe uh, they picked the wrong tomb. <laughs> like, they, they just like, hey, look, this, this tomb is empty. Jesus is alive, you know, and they just spread the word and it exploded. Well, his opponents, Jesus' opponents, which were many, all they would have to do at that point is go find the right tomb, right? And they're like, guys, you missed it. This is the real tomb. That's all they'd have to do. And, and all of that would have been put to, uh, to death right away. That movement would have died immediately, okay? Number two, some people say, well, well maybe they stole the body. And we're going to see in the text itself that there were some people who said, well, maybe that's the explanation. Um, well, if they stole the body, if the disciples stole the body and tried to hide it, then why would all of his original uh, followers, why would they be willing to lose their life for something they knew was a lie. I mean, not just the 12, but like so many more who watched Jesus and who witnessed all of this, like 
They willingly died a martyr's death when people killed them because they believed that it was true. You wouldn't do that if you stole the body. That doesn't make any sense. Now, the last one is that like Jesus pretended to die. <laughs> he was on the cross, you know, and he, he didn't really die. He was like, uh, you know, try to convince the Romans who were experts at killing people like that he kind of died. He swooned. That's the swoon theory. And like they put him in a, in a, a tomb and suddenly like he was able to whoop, come right back to the life, roll that massive stone away by himself and be like, what up, players? You know, I'm back from the dead. Look, again, the, the Romans were expert killers. They knew what they were doing. And when they put someone on a, on a Roman torture device like the cross, they either killed them or the, the guards were killed. They made sure that he was dead. In fact, they put a spear through Jesus to make sure that blood and water came out, which is a definition of, yeah, that's a dead body. Okay, look, the reason that the tomb was empty is because Jesus literally rose from the grave. There's no better explanation than all of that when you look it back in human history, okay? <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't steal the body because the body wasn't there. <laughs> like, he didn't pretend to die because he didn't, like, he, he rose again from the dead. Anyway, this is amazing. So here, here's what you have to do. In this, we have a dramatic decision to make. When you look back at human history and this critical, pivotal moment of human history, you know, what it does is it confronts us. How am I going to decide to respond to it? And again, the only way, I'm just going to go ahead and write this down in your notes. This is the big point for today. The only way to reopen your life to the experience of God and the power of God to trans transform you completely, the only way to fully reopen your life is to be open to God. You got to be open to him. You got to open wide your mind and your heart to what he wants to do in your life. So man, if you are skeptical, I want you to park your doubt at the door for today and go on a journey with me, okay? Now there's three main responses to why, to how we can respond to this critical, life-changing, history-altering moment. And it's right here in the text, okay? Option number one, right? You got the guards who, when they saw the angels flash like lightning, what did they do? Well, they, they became, like the text said, like dead men, okay? Now, we'll get back to that in a second. Option two is uh, doing what the Pharisees did. And I'm going to read to you uh, what they did. They explained it away and denied it. Watch this. This is right after this in verse 11 in Matthew 28. It says, Now, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went to the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you're to say to the disciples, uh, uh, you're to say the disciples came during the night. They stole him away. Again, that's the, the, the theory, right? Uh, while they were asleep. And if this report gets to the governor, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. All right. So the soldiers took the money, did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Okay. So option one, you can respond with a deadness in your mind, and your soul, your body. The soldiers were overwhelmed with it and they just went dead. Number two, uh, the Pharisees were like, well, let's deny it. Uh, let's pay it off and explain it away. That's number two uh, option. Now, number three is the women. They were terrified and yet they walked away with joy. So let's let's pick this apart one at a time, okay? Let's 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 begin with the Pharisees, okay? What did the Pharisees do? They explained it away and they denied it and they even paid off some guards. Why? Because Jesus' crucifixion did not fit in their worldview. They were monotheistic Jews. There's no way that they expected a you know, God himself in, in human form to come into this world and do for us what we couldn't do, and, and especially to die on the cross. God doesn't do that. It didn't fit their worldview, but it also didn't fit their agenda. You see, the Pharisees had all sorts of power and privilege and, and prestige in the community, and for them to submit to this idea that the God of the universe came and died for them, it would actually mean that they'd have to lose their control. They'd have to lose their power over the people at a religious level, and they didn't want to do that. That's why they crucified him. And so what they do, they denied it and they came up with an alternate explanation so that they can still maintain control in their life. Again, it wasn't because they looked at the evidence and said, the evidence can, compels me to look away from it. No, they said, we're going to deny it because we have a prior bias in our minds that says, I don't want this to be the case. Look, some of you think that the supernatural is not possible, right? That it's not possible to actually have God come into this world and be 
uh, you know, to rise again from the, the grave. But, but some of you, you, you say that because you, you're committed to science and science kind of explains everything in the world. But look, even some of the best scientists in all of history have said that we actually can't comment on the metaphysical. Uh, we, you know, some scientists have, have concluded that the world is a closed system of natural world only, not based on a scientific uh, discovery, but more from a philosophical angle. Ready? Richard Lewinton, and we mentioned this a couple weeks ago, who is a top evolutionary biologist. He said it this way. He says, we have a prior commitment to materialism, meaning a world without God, naturalism. It's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept the material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we're forced by our a priori adherence to material causes. We can't allow a divine foot in the door. <laughs> Meaning, we haven't looked at the evidence. No, it's a philosophy that brings us to the table and says, no, I don't want a God to exist in this, okay? Um, Francis Collins, who is leader of the Human Genome Project, brilliant guy, he actually came to faith because of his science. Watch this. He says, the Big Bang, which so many scholars have admitted, like this is probably how the world came into existence. He says, the Big Bang, it cries out for a divine explanation, not a... a a evolutionary only, but actually a divine explanation. He says it forces the conclusion that nature had a defined beginning. <laughs> Everything came from nothing, right? I see, he says, I cannot see how nature could have created itself. It's not logical. Only a supernatural force that is outside of space and time could have done that. And even Stephen Hawking, who remained an atheist to the end of his days, this is what he admitted. He says, it'd be very difficult to explain why the universe should have begun in just this way, except that it was an act of God who intended to create beings like us. So here's the challenge for us. What are you bringing into the evidence of Easter Sunday? What kind of prior adherence, what kind of you know, bias are you bringing into it? Are you looking at it objectively or are you looking at it because of what you want? Look, I got a friend who, uh, who says he's an atheist for Jesus. He likes the morals and the teachings of Jesus, but he keeps him at arm's length. He's not, not, not willing to say that he's God uh, and would rather explain the universe as a cause and effect, closed system, evolutionary only world because, not because of the evidence. The more we talk about it, he's like, yeah, this makes more sense, but I don't wanna give up my control. I like my life as it is. And maybe someday, you know, I'll try to get around to that. Look, more of us reject God and these supernatural for emotional reasons than we do for intellectual reasons. I remember watching uh, Pastor Tim Keller actually give a defense to uh, 500 Harvard students. You think Harvard, right? Some of the best and the brightest around the world. He was giving a defense for God and the existence of God and the supernatural and all that. And at the end, he had a Q&A session. And in the Q&A session, I was like, man, this is going to be great. All the best philosophical minds debating some of these ideas at a high level. The questions though, they weren't philosophical. They were personal. Why did God allow this to happen to my grandma? Why is evil and suffering the way that it is in this world? I mean, why, why do we go through such pain? See, some of us, we try to explain away some of the supernatural and, and what happened at Easter because we don't want it to be that way. We come up with an alternate explanation. And look, not just atheists and agnostics, Christians do the same thing. <laughs> We like to make God in our own image so that we can continue to maintain a sense of control in our life, right? Some of you, like you say that you might like Jesus, but you live however you want to with your money, with your sexuality, you know, with, with your job, with your friends. Like you're, you're just like, well, Jesus loves me and he forgives me and he's a good teacher, but you know, I'm going to keep living however I want to. Easter shows up violently. There's an earthquake in there and it shows up when bright flashes of light and God basically confronts us in that moment. He's like, what are you going to do with me? You're not on the throne of your life. And we don't want to submit to it because we like our control. Guys, look, I, I know this well, okay? Back when the pandemic started a year ago, um, me and, and, and along with me, a lot of other pastors, we kind of went a little crazy. We doubled our workload. We put everything online and we're doing all these messages and live streaming all the time. We worked, worked, worked because all of a sudden we didn't have our church family in front of us. And, and we're, like, we're struggling to try to figure out like, what do we do now? And I'm telling you, for me and for a lot of others, it was like we just wanted something to grip onto, something that we could maintain and control when everything in life had kind of all of a sudden become out of control. Maybe you're with me on that. 
Maybe there's some certain things that you're holding on to and you're not willing to bring all of yourself to the God of the universe who showed up in a dramatic way because you're just gripping onto it too tight. What are some things you're gripping onto? What are you holding onto too tight? And you just want to come up with an alternate explanation of who God is or what the supernatural is so that you can keep that elusive sense of control alive in your world. What is that? Well, here's the second thing, okay? That's, that's the Pharisees kind of explaining away. But you did have the other crew, the, the guards, right? When the angels showed up, what happened? It said they became like dead men. Now, here's what happens. The reason they become like dead men is because it was too overwhelming for them. They didn't want to take it all in. It was so overwhelming in that moment that they just decided, man, like, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. It's too much for me. And here's how we do it today. We numb out. We just like, look, I don't want to even think about God. I, I just want to check out. I, I want to go on vacation. Uh, I want to just kind of dominate my job. I want to, you know, dominate the so social media realm or video games or maybe numb out to Netflix for eight to 10 hours or like binge my phone. Like sometimes we just check out on life because it's just too much for us. I don't want to go there. That hurts too much. I, I don't want to, I, I would just rather overeat overwork, overdo whatever else rather than going there because I just want life to be comfortable. Anybody else on that one? Look, I get it. I get it. You know, life can be really painful and some of you gone through some really tragic stuff and it's just easy to just binge watch a show after show after show. But here's what's happened. When we do that, we check out on what is most meaningful and what is most transformative in life, okay? I mean, pornography skyrocketed in the pandemic. Netflix, social media, so many people just binged all that stuff. But as one author puts it, this is what happens when you numb out, right? He says, it's not that we have anything against God, depth, you know, or, or spirit. He says, we, we like these things, the supernatural. It's just that we're habitually too preoccupied to have any of these show up on our radar screens. Pathological busyness, distraction, and restlessness. These are the major blocks today within our spiritual lives. Guys, have you shut God out because it's just too overwhelming to really get honest about the wounds in your life and to actually bring them to God? It's vulnerable to actually get honest about it and, and try to open our life up to what God could do with that. But I'm telling you, if you explain it away and if you just numb out, you will never get your life to the place where you are fully open to the realities and the joys of what God could do in your life. And that's why it's good news that there's a third option here. What's the third option? Man, the women, when they showed up, they were afraid, they were terrified. And that's the reality. When God shows up in your life, there is a certain terror because you realize I'm not the author of the universe anymore. I'm not in control of everything. I, I can't make all the, the decisions. Like I, I can't maintain my life the way that I wanted it to. If he exists, there's some consequences there. There's fear that comes with that. There's a vulnerability. And yet the women were afraid and yet filled with joy because they caught something here, that God had come into this world not to condemn them, but to do for them what they could not do on their own. They had to, to get to the place of real joy, of really reopening their life. They had to be fully open to God, vulnerable, humility. And that was the only way that they would experience joy. And here's the really good news about this, guys. This is what they believed. They believed that the God of the universe came in to do for them what they could not do, meaning, that the depth of our sin and our suffering, like the, the way that we had rejected God and disbelieved him, it caused this gap, this massive chasm between us and God and, and really brought brokenness into this world where it, and, and disrepair into relationships and you know the framework of everything in this world, it separated us from God. And the consequences of that selfishness and that sin was so big that God alone could do the rescuing. God had to come in and die for us. But the good news was that he did, and he did it willingly. That God willingly come, came into this world and substituted himself on the cross so that we could be completely forgiven. The wrath of God for our punishment was brought on Jesus alone so that when we place our faith in him, God wipes the slate clean. We are completely forgiven. We were so bad that he had to die, but we're so loved that he was willing to die for us. And the women were caught by that, man. They were undone and they ran away with joy 
they believed, as John 3, 16 through 17 says, that God so loved the world that he gave his life willingly, his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. And not just forever, but like starting now, the reopening of everything in your life. It starts now when you place your faith in him. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Do you know what that means? When God is come and he rose again, defeating death, conquering sin and death forever, getting victory, that means that you don't have to be afraid. That's why the angel said, don't be afraid. And Jesus repeated it. Don't be afraid. Why? Because those things don't control you anymore. Your fear about your job or about your finances, they don't, they don't dominate you anymore. Your sin doesn't dominate you. Even the fear of death has no grip on those who trust in Jesus because he's got a better place for us. He's brought us out of sin and death into victory and eternal relationship with him forever. You don't have to be afraid of some of your crazy conspiracy relatives anymore. You don't have to be afraid of what other people think when you trust in Jesus because he's greater. He can open up everything. You don't have to be afraid about money issues because God provides for us. You don't have to be afraid because God did for us what we could not do. God wants to open up your life completely, but the only way to come to him is to do so as the women did. You've got to come to him in humility and brokenness, admitting your need for him. When they saw Jesus, what did they do? They gripped his feet. They clung to his feet. They knelt down and they worshiped him. Now that might sound crazy to you, why would I willingly like grovel at someone else's feet? I want to maintain control, but I'm telling you, God will never transform your life in the way that you need it until you come to him in humility. As Deuteronomy 4.29 says, but if you there, if you seek the Lord your God, if you come to him, you will find him if you seek him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. You got to bring everything. And here's the best news. When those women gripped the feet of Jesus and they opened their life completely to him, what feet did they see? It wasn't ordinary feet. Those feet had the wound marks of being nailed to the cross. You see, when God asks us to be vulnerable with him and to trust him with our whole life, he doesn't do so without having prior already done that for us. God was willing to die for you, to rescue you and me. But we got to remain open. Guys, what are you gripping onto? Maybe you're looking to your job or maybe your kids or your marriage or your health to satisfy you, to give you meaning, to give you significance and security. God's willing, God's asking you, be willing to give it to me so that I could be the one to fully reopen your life and to define you with a brand new meaning and satisfaction. Here's what I want to do. I want to invite you to go ahead and look at these stories. This is a compilation of all sorts of stories of lives who've been changed because they suddenly opened up their life. They were willing to let some things go and be open vulnerably to God and allow his power to come in and change them. So check out these stories. For most of my life, I've wrestled with guilt and shame, feeling like a chronic failure, wondering if all my selfish sins had left Jesus shaking his head at me in disappointment and disgust. And when COVID hit, my OCD pummeled me. I found myself floundering in this pit of shame and despair, unlike any I'd ever encountered. I honestly wondered if I'd ever make it out. But in my lowest moments, when I cried out to Jesus, he reminded me of who he really is and what he really did for me specifically. All those failures separating me from God that I was using up so much energy trying to battle, those are the exact things that he already paid for and defeated through his death and resurrection. Knowing every single one he still chose to purchase me. Every reminder of my failure is now transformed into one more testimony of the glorious, limitless grace and mercy of Jesus. He rescued me out of that pit and he continues to heal me every single day. So in 2019, we decided in the new year we would start tithing. But we eventually uh, allowed ourselves to get acclimated to tithing 10%. And it's really changed our lives. Um, 
We're definitely used to it now. It was a hard leap of faith at first, but we saw God bless us in many ways. Unfortunately, I was laid off um, during the pandemic. I was furloughed. We had um, a couple uh, car issues. There's a lot of examples that God has blessed us throughout this journey of um, just relying on him financially. And I actually was able to collect money from my full-time job while working a full-time job in the meantime. So because of that, uh, we were able to pay off all of our credit card debt. So we're now credit card debt free. Jeremy was able to get um, a better paying job. I was able to get a raise. I was able to actually work a lot of overtime. I just want to encourage people that um, it might seem scary at first, but if you just, um, you know, put your faith in him that he can definitely open doors and and now I swear by it, I can't picture myself not tithing now. Um, I would actually just encourage everybody to um, just try it out and see how God opens doors and blesses you. I didn't know where to go. I just got out of jail. So it was like, things were like falling apart. No money, no home, no car, things taken away. And so like I said, my aunt kept on telling me to find a, uh, church home and then yeah I didn't know what I was searching for so yeah I was like blind faith that's all it was just blind faith so I didn't know what to expect I just know like it felt home like it felt right so like I stuck with it the well was like actually the first place where I actually truly felt like a home a church home where I can actually be myself and not feel just so I didn't feel no strangely I didn't feel no judgment from nobody but what shifted is like I'm more aware that I know he loves me. I don't know, there's a difference between like struggling when you know you have God in your life and you know God has you, and it's a difference when like struggling, not believing that God has you and then that God is watching out for you. Those are like two different struggles because like you're gonna, you're gonna like that struggle, you're gonna feel alone. This struggle, you're not. No matter what you go through, like you're not gonna feel alone. This is where I want my life to be. Like, I want to follow him. Like, even though I'm gonna mess up, because I know I'm gonna mess up, but I know he loves me, so like, I want to follow him. I've never been one to proactively reach out to people or jump at opportunities to serve, uh, but when I took on a leadership role and was immediately thrust into a pandemic, I quickly realized how important it is to jump at opportunities that God presents to you. If you know someone is hurting or needs help or see a way you can contribute to God's mission, don't hesitate. That's Christ speaking to you in your heart. I used to be afraid I wouldn't provide the best support or have enough time to help others, but embracing these opportunities has made my life more joyful and given me a true realization about what it means to live fully for Christ. One of the worst moments of my life was when I was driving back by myself from my father's funeral. I remember feeling utterly alone and I did not feel God's presence at all. And I had perhaps the worst thought I've ever had in my life in my depression, where I thought, God, if I just, you know, drove off the road and hit that column or hit that tree, then my pain and suffering would be gone. And it was in that moment that a song, Death Was Arrested, came on the radio. And it talks about turning mourning into joy and turning ashes into beauty. And it talks about God being with us in the darkest of times, and I was flooded with the presence of God. I felt God saying, I have walked in pain and suffering. I know what it's like, and I'm here with you in this moment, and I will see you through this. And I felt uplifted, and I felt a glimmer of hope. And I was so, so thankful that God not only was with me in my darkest moment after my dad's passing, but that he understood what pain and suffering are. This is incredible. And this power is available for you and it's available for me, but you've got to open up to God. What's holding you back? Maybe today you've never trusted in Jesus before. I want to give you a moment to just open your life up wide. So I'm going to invite you to pray with me now and we're going to begin a conversation to just open up completely to God. Let's pray. Jesus, we just want to say uh, we've blown it. We confess, God, that we've not measured up to your standard. We confess 
that we haven't done what you've asked us to do. We've, we've lived selfishly. We haven't believed in you, God, and, and we've contributed to the brokenness in this world. We have. And for that, God, we're truly sorry. But we wanna bring that to you, God, because we believe that just as the women came vulnerably to you and, and, and knelt down at your feet and say, God, we're willing to let you rearrange the furniture in our life to reorganize everything so that we'd follow you, God. We're willing to do that too, because we believe today that Jesus died for me. And simply by placing my faith in you, God, I wanna receive that gift of forgiveness and eternal life, a salvation that I couldn't have earned that you gave to me for free. I embrace that, I accept it, and I say, God, have your way in my life. I wanna follow you, I'm yours. Would you accept that today? In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, this is why we celebrate Easter. This is why we exist as a church, to reconcile people with their Heavenly Father and to open up their life to His transformative power, not just to give you hope for all eternity, but to change you now and to make you into the kind of people that would be His agents of life-giving transformation everywhere in the world. Man, if, if you did that, if you trusted in Jesus, I encourage you, pull out that digital connection card and just let us know that you trusted in Jesus for the first time today. We wanna to come alongside you, we wanna encourage you, we wanna empower you and join you in that journey. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, next week, we're gonna continue this series, Unquarantine, as we talk about how do we overcome some more barriers uh, when, when it comes to opening up to God, and then we'll conclude it in a week from there about how, how crazy transformative it is to trust Him. We love you guys. Enjoy your Easter. What a great message. Remember, the crucifixion was God's ultimate act of sacrificial love for you. And the resurrection proves that you can have a new life in Jesus, a new life here and now with real purpose, real peace and real power, an eternal life in the presence of God's love. So no matter who you are, or what you've done, this, this love and this forgiveness is available to you right now. You know, maybe you've never given your life to Jesus before. We well, can do that right on your digital connection card by checking the box. Send me more information about beginning a relationship with Jesus. And we would love to come alongside you as you start your transformative journey. Now, right now we're gonna worship through our giving and you guys are so generous, thank you. You know, it allows us to put into action God's transformative power by helping our friends and neighbors know Jesus, meeting real needs in our community, our city, and even all over the world. You can click the give button right here on our live stream page in the info section, or you can give on our website at thewellnh.org slash give, or you can even give by texting, by texting the dollar sign and the amount to 84321. You can give a one-time gift or a regular gift by automating your giving. Now, next Sunday, we are continuing our series, Unquarantined, and our next in-person service is not next Sunday, but Sunday, April 18th. And we're gonna have our live stream experience. Don't worry, we have our online campus every single Sunday. So we hope to eventually see you in person, hopefully on the 18th, but if not, you can always check us out here online. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday.